The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular, but in June 2010, they will become even more so. 32 teams will set out in pursuit of a dream to become world champions. This is Destination South Africa. Coming up, so often the nearly men of the World Cup, can Holland finally win football's biggest prize? Or will the likes of Cameroon, Denmark and Japan prove too strong in Group E? Are the champions ready to defend their title? Italy are full of confidence as the kickoff approaches. We'll also hear from their Group F opponents, New Zealand, Slovakia and Paraguay. Group E is very cosmopolitan. The Dutch will line up against African, European and Asian opposition. If World Cup success is built on the foundations of a qualifying campaign, the Netherlands have every reason to be optimistic about their trip to South Africa. The Dutch were simply unstoppable winning all eight group games. So will 2010 finally be their year? You know, we always get the compliments about uh, our, our football, uh, about our, our, uh, our passing play and uh, the, the technique in the team. But, uh, you know, to win a tournament you need, you know, a bit, a bit more than that. And uh, we all uh, are aware of that because most of the players uh, you know, now going to, to, to South Africa, they were playing against um, in the Euros, uh, the last Euros as well. Uh, there we played uh, very good against team, uh, teams as, as France and Italy. And then at, at, at Russia we had an half day and uh, we were out of the tournament. So uh, I'm, I'm sure we've learned from that and uh, we can go one step higher now. Holland easily won their qualifying group and much of the credit has to go to Van Marwijk in his first campaign. Even though Holland's resolute defence was breached only twice in their eight qualifying games, coach Bert van Marwijk knows his team's strength lies firmly in attack. At his disposal are several star players at Europe's biggest clubs. In class Jan Huntelaar, Holland have a striker who's found the net consistently and must now do that again in South Africa. So often Huntelaar's supplier, Arjen Robben, scored during the 2006 World Cup Finals. The Bayern Munich winger provides pace and ammunition from wide areas. Liverpool's Dirk Kaus is another survivor from Germany 2006, and he was among the goals during qualifying. Into Milan's midfielder Wesley Schneider comes equipped with tournament experience and is integral to Holland's attack. A fully fit Robin van Persie would be a major threat, whether deployed on the wing or up front. The midfield bite is supplied by Nigel de Jong and Mark van Bommel, van Marwijk's son-in-law. Not for the first time, a Dutch coach heads to a major tournament with an enviable squad. I think we as uh, Holland, we try to play football on the ground and, and we try to always uh, 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 make the game. Uh, we know uh, what we can do, so we don't uh, try to wait on, on other, other opponents or, or uh, anticipate on them, you know. We know what our strengths are and um, yeah, we have a lot of uh, quality, a lot of potential and uh, hopefully uh, everybody's ready uh, when the World Cup starts. During the qualifiers, uh, we still had to win each game and, and try to uh, stay focused uh, until the last minute and uh, I think uh, yeah that's a, a big uh, compliment for the team uh, that we reach uh, uh, a, a thing like that and um, yeah at the end um, now uh, yeah I think it's important to to uh, do it on the World Cup 
uh, try to get fo be focused on every game and, and, and uh, yeah, try to come, uh, like I said before, as uh, far as possible and then hopefully maybe win the World Cup. I think he trying to progress the team. Uh, there was already, a, I thought, a, a good team, but uh, he just uh, tried to, to, to work on it ev even harder and to make you know, all these good players uh, uh, look like, like a good team. And I think uh, you know, that's what, what he showed. Uh, like I said, we, uh, we were unbeaten in the, in the group stage. And uh, you know, we also, we all also give us the belief that if we want to do something, you know, we, we had to start like two years ago when we first uh, played the, the qualification game. So, uh, you know, it makes us aware of the importance of, of every game we play for, uh, for our country. Holland opened their World Cup campaign at Soccer City against Denmark before playing Japan in Durban and Cameroon in Cape Town. I think uh, it's, a, it's a still a tough group. Um, yeah, most, pe most people are still thinking in a way of that's a small country or that's a big country, but I think last few years you don't have that anymore. Um, each country who qualified for the World Cup is a dangerous opponent, so I think it's still um, a, good, uh, a good group. It was party time in Yaoundé when Cameroon qualified for South Africa 2010. The indomitable Lions were back at the World Cup after missing out for Germany 2006. And the fans aren't just happy, they're super confident. I knew they were going to win. It's a pleasure and a joy because we've regained our international recognition, which is what we wanted. I'm so happy today. It's not just the victory, but the fact we've found pleasure in football once again. It's very important for us, very important for the country, you know, because when Cameroon play, the country is very happy. You know, because it's Africa is a very difficult situation now. Something can just make someone happy. Mm. It's football. Mm. If you didn't play the World Cup, it's very, very, very bad situation for the country because it's the first tournament like World Cup in Africa. Cameroon claimed just one point from their first two games in qualifying, but managed to turn things around. Frenchman Paul Le Guen replaced Otto Pfister as coach and the team recorded four wins in their last four matches to qualify for their sixth World Cup, an African record. He has the pick of some top players. Samuel Eto'o is the country's talisman and captain. Promising young striker Pierre Weibo plays at Mallorca in Spain's Primera Liga. The veteran midfielder Jeremy won the Premier League twice with Chelsea before joining Newcastle United. Whilst Benoit Asuekoto is a regular at Tottenham Hotspur. And Arsenal's midfielder Alex Song brings more experience of top flight European football. And playing abroad has ignited even more interest in the indomitable Lions back home in Africa, where the locals watch their heroes every week on television. Everyone watch Arsenal in the country, you know. When I just go here, everyone love Arsenal. You know, if Arsenal play, you go on the street, you will see nobody on the street. Everyone just come, just watch the game, you know. When I go on the country, the last time I be there, just the guy say, I watch your game, we play against, uh, we play against Blackburn at home. Say, so, uh, why you don't score? Everyone <laughs> score. <laughs> you know, everyone, but I'm um, just say it's the football. Sometimes you score, sometimes you don't score, but everyone in this country is happy for my situation. You know, everyone is love. When I go there, I'm enjoy all the time. Cameroon will need a good start if they're to progress. They kick off against Japan, then face Denmark. But the real test will come against top seeds Holland. But Cameroon are one of Africa's best hopes of lifting the trophy. Cape Town hosts five group games at the 70,000-seat Greenpoint Stadium and one of the semi-finals. The city is the provincial capital of the Western Cape, sitting under the shadow of the magnificent Table Mountain. The stadium itself is brand new, 
and located just a short distance from the coastline. At night, when illuminated, it will resemble a rose-coloured bowl floating on a base. The venue was built in two and a half years at a cost of $600 million. Cape Town is ready to play its part at the 2010 World Cup. It's been eight long years, but Denmark are back at the World Cup finals. Time for celebrations again in Copenhagen. Denmark were on their way to South Africa. It was a team effort this time. Denmark has also had a bit of luck uh, in the qualification, we have to say that. Um, we have used a lot of players, many injuries, uh, but nevertheless, after eight years, it, it was about time. World Cup qualifying saw Denmark go head-to-head -head with neighbours Sweden. These games followed a remarkable Euro 2008 qualifier in Copenhagen. It was the strangest night I've ever seen and the strangest match I've ever seen. The Swedes went up 3-0 in the first half. Making three goals out of nowhere. The Danes got a, a goal before half time, and then in the second half, the Danish team just went wild. Daniel Agger began the Danish revival. John Dahl Thomason scored a second. And then Leon Andresen completed a remarkable comeback. But the drama had only just begun. But then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a Swedish player falls down in the penalty box. And it turns out that the Danish player Christian Poulsen has hit him. It was a crazy night for us and also for me personally I got the red card and uh, yeah, it was a crazy match. So the referee calls a penalty and <laughs> some guy in the stands, and he's very drunk and it gets too much for him. So he climbs over uh, and runs into the pitch and wants to attack the referee. And two Danish players get in between and get him stopped. The game was banned, and then we lost the game 0-3. Uh, for um, yeah, a decision from UEFA, uh, that was a terrible game. It was uh, something special, but it was terrible the way it ended. Then Mark loses the game 3-0 on on that. It was a mad, mad night in Denmark. So Denmark arrived at the Rosunda Stadium in Stockholm with an opportunity. Could they overcome their rivals, who'd beaten them so controversially two years earlier? A good performance would also lay to rest the painful memories of that night in the Parken Stadium. We always want to beat Sweden, and especially after the, the last time we met them at, uh, in Denmark, where there was this big scandal. So once again, a Scandinavian derby in the qualifiers. Sweden against Denmark at the Rosunda. Things looked to be going Sweden's way when Simon Kjær fouled Olaf Melberg inside the penalty area. A great chance for Sweden to take the lead. But Thomas Sorensen was equal to Kim Schallström's penalty. Inspired, the Danes pushed on, and a few minutes later, Thomas Kallenberg capitalised on a mistake in the Swedish defence. Kallenberg with the goal, 1-0 to Denmark. But the Danish keeper was the hero of the day. Thomas Sørensen saved the penalty and possibly played one of his best games. I think our goalkeeper says basically saved us. If 
important win because it was against Sweden, but but also in the group it gave us some breathing space. It came at a good time. Um, any away win against the top two, top three sides is is crucial. The decisive qualifier would be the return match against rival Sweden in Copenhagen. Victory for Denmark would guarantee their qualification for South Africa. Sweden needed to keep their hopes alive with a victory. It was party time in Copenhagen. The Scandinavian derby had arrived once again. Tonight we're friends. Oh. <laughs> there is obviously that rivalry and, and uh, that mutual respect and, and uh, you know, it's all about honour really. With pride and World Cup qualification riding on the result, it was a tense affair. There were few chances for either team. Then, 12 minutes from time, Jakob Poulsen struck for the Danes. 1-0 the final score, and Denmark were going to South Africa. They finished two points ahead of group favourites Portugal and recorded victories home and away against Sweden. We have a lot of players who've been in and around the team and they've all come in with good attitude and done really well. So I think it looks bright. Coming the summer 2010, I think we will, will be a stronger side. I think uh, we know we, we were, we're a smaller nation and we can't have a squad like England or Brazil or, or France, but uh, on the day we know that we can beat anyone and, and, and that will be our incentive to, to do well at the World Cup. Denmark start their World Cup against Holland at Soccer City on June the 14th and then they meet Cameroon and Japan. Japan, Asia's most successful footballing nation of recent years. They've won three of the last five Asia Cups. Qualification for South Africa 2010 means they've now made it to four consecutive World Cup tournaments. Confidence and optimism are high in the land of the rising sun, where the footballing future promises much. We want to play the best football we can. We aim to play at our best, and if we do, then I can see no reason why we can't reach the semi-finals and become one of the top four sides in South Africa. Head coach Takashi Okada is a former Japanese international. He won two J-League titles as manager of Yokohama Marinos. Now he's in his second spell in charge of the national team. He led them to the World Cup in France in 1998, where they lost every game. But Okada has seen a distinct improvement in the team and Japanese football. Back then, professional football in Japan was new and the players didn't have much experience of playing on the world stage. They were overwhelmed by the other national teams. Now, many of the players are with European clubs and that gives them a stronger mentality and they're more experienced. That new maturity shone through in the Middle East against Bahrain. Espanyol's Shinsuke Nakamura put them one up after 18 minutes with a typically brilliant free kick. Japanese pressure led to a handball in the Bahrain area just before half-time. Yasuhito Endo made no mistake from the spot. Kengo Nakamura made it 3-0 with five minutes left. Although Bahrain scored two in the last couple of minutes, Japan clinched victory, 3-2. That result meant Japan made a winning start to the fourth and final phase of qualification. The Samurai Blue went on to win four, draw three and lose just one of their eight matches in Group 1. A one-all draw at home to Uzbekistan and a 2-1 defeat in Australia were the low points. After that game against Uzbekistan, many experts questioned whether Japan would even qualify for the World Cup. With Australia now part of the Asian qualifying region, qualification had become much more problematic. Defeat to the Socceroos in Melbourne and a nil-nil draw in Tokyo meant that Australia finished top of the group, with Japan in second place. But the inclusion of the Aussies has been a source of motivation for Asian nations. 
With Australia now joining in the Asian division, it's helped the game here. They bring a more European, high-level style of football. This will lead to an improvement in the Asian game, and I'm sure that this will mean we, as a nation, will also improve. The Japanese team were made to work hard for their qualification, but in the end it was deserved. And coming through that challenge may stand them in good stead when Japan meets stiffer opposition in the summer. We played some good games and some bad games, and we lost the match too. However, we improved throughout the whole process. So I'm really happy with the fact that we've qualified for the World Cup. The Samurai Blue were below par in Germany in 2006. Their fans will expect a better showing this time around. Star man Hidetoshi Nakata is now gone, but the team is not short on talent. Espanol Shunsuke Nakamura is the new golden boy of Asian football. Nagoya Grampus striker Keiji Tamada is the main source of goals. And with over 90 caps for his country, captain Yuji Nakazawa is a mainstay in defence. And back home, the nation isn't so much optimistic as undecided. I think Japan have got a really interesting group. Mm. We can make it, definitely. I think we can win at least two games. The first game will be decisive, so I hope we win, but it will take a huge effort. A squad with experience at the very highest level, an experienced coach and an optimistic attitude. Can Japan become only the second Asian nation to reach the last four of the World Cup? After recent progress, maybe that's not beyond the realms of possibility for the land of the rising sun. Marcello Lippi's Italy are in Group F, along with New Zealand, Slovakia and Paraguay. Four years ago, Italy wrote another chapter in the history of world football. They won the World Cup for a fourth time. Captain Fabio Cannavaro stepped off the plane with the trophy, greeted by a triumphant country. Fabio Grosso was the man who struck the winning penalty in the final shootout. In Italy, if you're world champions, or if you've had a terrible few years, it doesn't really matter. There's always so much pressure on us. We're a nation that has a proud sporting history, so every time we represent our country, we have to play at the level we're renowned for. We know that a lot of people expect so much, but we're working hard to get back to what we had prior to 2006, which is going into games and not feeling inferior to anyone. And that's what will be our main strength again, hopefully. But the big question hovering over this Italian team is how far they've progressed in the past four years. Few young players are coming through the ranks, and the World Cup winning generation are an ageing force. We have good young players, but I think the side is still made up of players who are past their peak now. I don't think we should compare this side to the 2006 team. That historic group of players are still here. The squad who won in Berlin. They're obviously four years older, but these players are still top class. In qualifying, the Italians saw off nations like Montenegro, Bulgaria, Cyprus and Georgia. But Lippi's team still lacks an element of fantasy. The traditional Italian number 10 is missing from this lineup. And Lippi has controversially snubbed the inform but unpredictable Antonio Cassano. That sort of player doesn't really fit into Lippi's tactical plans. We know he holds Giuseppe Rossi in very high regard, but he's still young and not very consistent. But I think he could be a player that Lippi hopes to use a lot. No, we all know that he's a great coach. Um, he showed it with other teams. He's coached at club level and even 
four years ago when he won the World Cup. Um, so it's always great to have such a you know such an important coach with us, and um, you know his way of doing things are great, and um, we're all just you know fitting in well. Lippi knows that his current Italian side is far from the finished article, yet history is on his side. Even in 2006, his team were never regarded as the favourites. Brazil and Spain are probably better than us, but a World Cup is different. Let's not forget 2006. There's still time to put together a team who can defend the title and win a fifth World Cup. The main aim of the manager has always been to create a united group, as if we were a club rather than a national team. I think we've always managed to do that. We've done it again with all the players who've been on this campaign. So we're ready to play in South Africa. While qualifying was relatively smooth, there were some testing moments. In October 2009, they travelled to Ireland, managed by an Italian coach, Giovanni Trapattoni. Ireland had to win. The Azzurri needed just a point to ensure their passage to South Africa. Their passionate fans travelled to Dublin, certain that their side could get the necessary result. Today is going to be match draw. 1-1, one, one, neo neo 2-2, because in the end of the day, Italy need only point to qualify. And any animosity towards their team was now forgotten. Both fans and players had a common goal, qualifying for the 2010 World Cup. It was a game where we had to get a result to qualify. An enthralling game would prove to be one of Lippi's toughest examinations. Keith Andrews once again. And this is for the run of Keith, who's outside this time. Out of the middle, Negritania who fouls him. Liam Lawrence will take the free kick. Pulled back here. Here's the goal! First time we've seen him do that. Cameron Easy with the cross. Headed away, not too convincingly. Grosso! Straight at Shea Given. Corner coming from Pirlo. Beautiful swing on it. Oh, sir! It's there. It's Cameron Easy. Italy are level. Here's Pirlo, Chiellini, 2-1. Final touch to Jack Winters. Offside. It's offside though. It's hot. And Zafrana knocks it over. Stephen Hunt. It's there! It's Sean St. Ledger's first international goal, and what a time to get it! 87th minute, and the scoreline reads Ireland 2, Italy 1. Oh, a chance here for a breakout. And it's Pepe. Pepe on for the Aquinta. The Aquinta. Oh, a chance here! Oh, it's there! It had to be Gilardino. If Trapattoni's substitution works a dream, so does Marcello Lippi's. Final minute, and Italy square it. So Alberto Gilardino's injury time equaliser gave the Italians top spot in their qualifying group and the chance to defend their title in South Africa. The strength of this group is a sense of spirit and unity between the players. We all get on very well which is very important given that you have to spend a month together at a World Cup. The champions begin their defence on June the 14th in Cape Town against Paraguay before they face New Zealand and Slovakia. Playing in a World Cup in an African country won't be like playing in Europe or like a World Cup anywhere else. So I think playing in Africa 
gives hope to every nation. New Zealand are back at the World Cup finals. It's been 28 years since the All Whites' only previous appearance on the world stage, back at Spain 1982. And it's that long ago, even the Kiwis are getting excited. Because we're a pretty, pretty laid-back country, New Zealand. We kind of, uh, we don't really show our emotions that much. And um, I know, for, for 36,000 who were there, and for the whole country to, to just, just to get, just to go crazy, was um, it was pretty cool. With Australia now competing in Asian qualifying, it was easy for New Zealand to top the Oceania group ahead of New Caledonia and Fiji. That meant a two-legged playoff against Bahrain. It was a long trip to the Persian Gulf for the first leg. We're going over to there a bit, um, a wee bit naive, a bit underprepared. Very honestly, the first game, we were lucky. The conditions were really, really difficult for us coming from New Zealand because we played in 35, 36 degree heat and, and it was extremely difficult. To go there and to, and to get a 0-0 result was, um, was, a, was an incredible result for us. If a hot and passionate match had proved problematic in the Middle East, the return leg in Wellington brought its own challenges. I suppose I was a wee bit nervous just because um, it, it had been built up in New Zealand um, that if we'd won the game, we'd go to the World Cup, and and um, so the whole the whole country got behind it, and they, you know they they filled the stadium and the, and the, the media and everything about it was was probably what you're used to in the Premier League, but because it's in front of your home fans, and I've never played like that in front of your home fans, and uh, and it's um, wouldn't 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 be nerves, but it was a, it was a, it was an excitement that um, I hadn't felt before, um, especially in New Zealand. All to play for, 90 minutes. History beckons. Which way will this one go? That they weren't going to beat us in New Zealand. They were not going to beat us in New Zealand because, I mean, we play well at home. We play well at home and the crowd was behind us and everything was against Bahrain. And Rory Fallon, New Zealand's man of destiny, had his own links with Spain 1982. The Plymouth Argyle player was just three months old when his father Kevin Fallon travelled to Spain as a coach with the New Zealand national team. Now he's made his own mark on New Zealand's history. It was the perfect time to score and um, we went into half time 45 minutes away from the World Cup. Then in the second half came a major setback, a penalty to Bahrain. And the referee points to the spot. I just thought, you know, here we go, it's the same old. New Zealand football, you know, we always seem to trip up somewhere. Adnan. Said Adnan. Great save, Mark Peston. What a save, Peston. That night, it just, it just seemed to be that it was meant to be. It is all over! Ricky Herbert's men have emerged from the shadows and into the light. And I don't think we left the stadium for a good hour or two hours after. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the fans, the people back home, you know, the, the city turned it on for us that night as well. And I think even the bus journey back to the hotel, you know, it was probably a mile, took us close to two hours to get back. Bahrain will be looking back and saying, well, they missed those chances in the first leg. They missed a penalty in the, in the second leg. I mean, you've only got to blame yourself and, you know, really. Um, so... I mean, Ricky has always said, and, and I mean, this is, this is quite good, Ricky has always said it was in the stars. And we would, you know, it was our time, you know, 1982, 20, 26, 28 years ago, it was in the stars. And, and he's, he's never changed his thought, you know. New Zealand are a physical team who will relish the World Cup challenge. Coach Ricky Herberts wore the silver fern in the historic 1982 campaign. And his return to the big time comes as the leader of a squad playing and believing in an English brand of football. Players that um, people haven't heard of done really well. You know, we had the boy Shane Smeltz who scored a lot of goals in, in the campaign. I think he scored maybe eight or nine in, in, the, in the run up to the, you know, the playoff leg. And um, so Ryan Nelson's a big player for us. Um, you know, someone we miss when, when he's not playing and, um, you know, he's our captain and our leader at the back. We will definitely um, scare a few people. Um, uh, whether, whether we've got the quality to, to get points and to get wins, I don't know, who, who knows. I feel that 
in past um, Config Cup competitions, uh, the Olympics have been in, we really didn't know where we were we, in terms of who we're, who we're kind of fighting against. We didn't really believe that we were, you know, we're happy to be there. And, and I, but I think this team's a bit different. It's a bit more experienced and, uh, and uh, I think we kind of, we're realistic, but we'd like to get, like to get some results. New Zealand opened their World Cup campaign in Rustenburg against Slovakia. Italy and Paraguay follow. I think we're definitely the underdogs, and I think all the uh, obviously all the teams will, um, you know, be uh, jumping up for joy. They've got us, and that's what we want. You know, we want them to to be like that. And that's how every New Zealand team is in most sports. And um, as I said, we 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 punch above our weight and um, and scare a lot of few, a lot of teams in, in a lot of countries and in, in every other sport. So we'll be just hopefully doing the same in, in football. The capital of the Umpa Malanga province is Nelspruit, and it will host the Italy and New Zealand clash at the Umbombella Stadium. Nelspruit is approximately three hours' drive from Johannesburg, lying 60 miles from the Mozambique border, an area renowned for its beauty. The stadium can hold 46,000 fans and is another new structure made for the World Cup. Located close to the Kruger National Park, it was funded by the government and the main features are the 18 roof supports that resemble giraffes. Honduras will play Chile here and the stadium will also host Australia versus Serbia and North Korea against Ivory Coast. Home to just over 5 million people, Slovakia has only existed as an independent country since 1993. Formerly part of Czechoslovakia, the Slovaks had previously failed to qualify for any major international tournament. And few gave them any chance of making it to this one. Drawn in Group 3 alongside Northern Ireland, San Marino, Slovenia, Poland and the Czech Republic, the Slovaks beat the Irish 2-1 in Bratislava in their opening game. But defeat against Slovenia in Maribor meant Slovakia then faced an unbeaten Poland side at home, needing a win to restore their qualification morale. Vladimir Weiss's men knew that defeat would seriously dent their chances of qualifying. And early in the second half, all Slovaks feared the worst when Ebi Smolarek gave Poland the lead. But in the dying minutes, Slovakia sprang to life and got their campaign back on track. Stanislav Seštak scored twice in two minutes to earn three crucial points. The 2-1 victory sparked wild celebrations in Bratislava and revived Slovakia's dream of making it to South Africa. The turning point was the match against Poland. We managed to turn the score around from losing 1-0 to winning 2-1 in the final minutes of the game, thanks to Stani Sestak. That moment kick-started our qualification campaign. We began to believe in ourselves and realise we had a great chance of making it to the World Cup. Slovakia's first ever victory against the Czech Republic in Prague was followed by this 7-0 hammering of San Marino. It moved the Slovaks into first place in European qualifying Group 3. That set up a return match against the Czech Republic in September 2009. With the Slovaks on the brink of qualification and their former compatriots looking to keep alive their own hopes, the stakes were high in Bratislava. Early in the first half, Seštak scored his sixth goal of the campaign to put Slovakia 1-0 up. The lead lasted only 10 minutes. Daniel Kudil beating Jan Mucha in the Slovakian goal 
to draw the Czechs level. Moments later, Yaroslav Plazil pulled back Radoslav Zabavnik. That gave Marek Hamšík the chance to restore Slovakia's lead. 2-1 to the Slovaks. But once again, the Czechs responded. Milan Baroš making it 2-2. A draw on the night, but this was a serious blow to the Czech Republic's qualification hopes. The rivalry between the Czechs and the Slovaks is huge. Some of their players came out in the press afterwards and said we didn't deserve to qualify for the World Cup. But that's just sour grapes in my opinion. We beat them at their place and we drew with them at home, so we fully deserve to qualify. Defeat in their penultimate game at home to Slovenia meant Slovakia had to win in Poland in their final match to ensure automatic qualification. A Polish own goal was enough for a 1-0 victory in Czortsov. So Slovenia finished second and the Czechs missed out. Representing a fiercely patriotic people, the Slovakian players are looking to make history. On their shoulders rest the hopes of all their countrymen as they prepare to take their World Cup bow. Qualification itself is a remarkable achievement for us. We've got nothing to lose, so we'll be giving it our all and hopefully surprise a few people in South Africa. It will be a great experience, both for us players and for future generations of Slovakian footballers, who will learn a great deal about the World Cup. South Africa 2010 can only help us move forward. We have a young team who will gain a great deal from the experience. And one day in the future, we'll hopefully achieve even better things. Slovakia are in Rustenburg on June the 15th to meet New Zealand before they face Paraguay and Italy. When Paraguay qualified for South Africa, it underlined their growing reputation as one of South America's strongest nations. The team they call the Alberoja will be appearing for their fourth consecutive World Cup finals. But they seem divided about their chances. People have different opinions. There are both optimists and pessimists. There are many who support us and have great faith in us and believe we'll reach the quarter-finals. And then there are others who've already given up on us, who think we won't even get past the group stage. Roque Santa Cruz's goals will be vital if Paraguay are to make an impact at the World Cup. The striker now with Manchester City in the English Premier League is perhaps his country's most successful export ever. The fact that Santa Cruz only scored three times in the qualifiers was down to a serious knee injury that forced him to miss the last ten games of the campaign. He's a player with a lot of experience and great ability. He's a major part of what we have, and we've missed him in the squad and in recent games. He's somebody who can play as an out-and-out -out striker or just behind the forwards. We did the hard work whilst he was injured and we're hoping that now he can contribute to the cause because we know what he means to the team. It all began for Paraguay with a goalless draw away to Peru. Then they beat Uruguay 1-0 in Asuncion. But it was this 5-1 home win over Ecuador that kick-started the campaign. It's Morel's corner and the header is in. It has been coming. Nelson Aido Valdez to Paraguay. Finally, Nelson Aido Valdez with his second goal of qualifying has given Paraguay the lead. Paraguay won Ecuador nil. Morel's ball in, across the face, and turned in by Riveros. It is the repeat performance, it's 2-0.
Tactically, we've improved so much during the qualifying campaign. Sometimes we'd change the numbers of forwards, midfielders or defenders. So we'd always be changing the formation of the side. Next, Gerardo Martino took his side to Chile. A tough test, passed with flying colours. Missing ball here, which Aido Valdez picks on here for Salvador. Cabanas for Paraguay! Cabanas scores! It is Chile nil, Paraguay one. And the away team have the breakthrough goal. Banyas finds the finish, composed and calm here as he went through. Da Silva's header, it's a second goal! It is 2-0 for Paraguay. Salvador Cabanas with a delivery. And a free header, where was the marking gone? Banyas with the corner and the header is in for three! It's that man again! We won several important games, home and away. I think we've worked hard on tactics. And we've still got so many players who played under the previous coach anyway. So we've put together a good squad, and I think it's been great. Paraguay booked their place in South Africa with two games to spare. And they're keen to do better than their tame first round exit in Germany four years ago. Their Argentine coach, Gerardo Martino, has enjoyed success in the Paraguayan club game in recent years. But the pressure is on him to deliver, bearing in mind what happened to a certain Uruguayan coach four years ago. I think that how we do in the World Cup has a lot to do with if I continue in the job or not. Manuel Ruiz led the team to the last World Cup. He's a great man, very honest, who'd made Paraguay his home and settled here. But due to the failure at the last World Cup, he obviously had to leave the job. Martina was appointed in 2007, taking over from Raul Amaria, who'd replaced the much maligned Ruiz on an interim basis. The natural choice, Martina was named South American Coach of the Year in 2007, after winning his fifth Paraguayan league title with Club Libertad. What stands out most about Paraguay are the forwards. People used to label us as a defensive team, a team that doesn't let you play, that kicks you and stamps on you. It's not that we played bad football, but today we've added a lot more to our game. We've more ways of winning a game than just a high ball into the box. Paraguay's finest performance in an excellent campaign came in their home match with Brazil. The hosts were looking to make it four successive victories while Brazil were unbeaten in their opening four matches. Paraguay was superb, dominating the game from start to finish. Roque Santa Cruz on Mark Barbos puts it home. Paraguay in front. When we beat Brazil in Asuncion, we said to ourselves, if we keep this up, we'll qualify. It's Santa Cruz, Cabanas making his way into the middle. Santa Cruz goes himself, and he's there! Cabanas scores from underneath the crossbar. Ten man Paraguay double their lead. After results like that, it seems strange to reflect that Paraguay have only ever been champions of South America twice, in 1953 and then again in 1979. At times it was easy for us defenders to keep our opponents at bay because the team worked so hard together. And I think because of that we kept so many clean sheets and scored a lot of goals. Paraguay's 1-0 win in Asuncion over Diego Maradona's men sealed their place in South Africa with two games to spare. In 2006, we thought we had no chance against England, simply because they were England. 
So mentally, we'd already lost before we played the game. Now, things are very different. Perhaps it's got to do with the way in which the players are maturing. In the national team, there are lots of us who've been playing together for quite some time. And we all ask the same things, like, why didn't we play differently? Why didn't we go out and attack more instead of sitting back so much? Paraguay eventually finished the South American qualifying section, level on points with Chile, and just one point behind Brazil. And in South Africa, they're in Group F, alongside holders Italy, first-time finalist Slovakia, and rank outsiders New Zealand. So they'll be hopeful of finishing in the top two. The sights and sounds of South Africa are already spectacular. But in June 2010, they will become even more so. 32 teams will set out in pursuit of the dream to become world champions. Make sure you don't miss football's greatest show on earth. World Cup.